All right, good afternoon and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Ken Nowak from the Bureau of Reclamation, and we're very pleased to have Rowan Schmidt and Corrine Cooley from Earth Economics to present on Nature's Value in the Colorado River Basin. Thank you to everyone for joining us today, and special thanks to Rowan and Corrine for sharing this work with us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you are all muted right now. At the end, we'll have time for some questions, so please wait then. If you do have a question, you'll be asked to use the raise your hand feature and you'll be called on, at which point you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, I'm now going to turn it over to our presenters. All right, uh, this is Corinne Cooley from Earth Economics, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, am I audible? Am I clear enough uh, from audio? Oh, it looks like we might need to wait just a moment to make sure everyone is able to hear. Just let me know when I should go how to pray it. I think we're all set. Okay, Victoria had messaged me and said to wait for a moment. Okay, sounds like we're good. All right, excellent. Um, all right, well, I'll get going here. So just to give you a sense of what we're going to cover today, um, I'll be starting out and doing an overview of who we at Earth Economics are, what our approach is to calculating the economic value of nature, um, some of the uh, concerns that we dealt with when we were approaching using um, these techniques in the Colorado River Basin, and the results that we saw. Um, and then I'll hand things over to Rowan, and he'll talk some more about what we can actually do with these values um, and a whole bunch of different contexts and applications for them. So without further ado, I will get rolling. So Rowan and I both work with Earth Economics. We're an economic think tank based out of Tacoma, Washington. We've been around for some time. We were founded in 1998. And our goal is to ensure that nature is included in decision-making by using economic tools to service the value in a way that can be readily understood and incorporated. And so we've published a large number of reports that span the nation and also around the world. We've worked in Latin America, South America, North America, a little bit in Asia, um, and Islandia, Oceania, and uh, it's been, you know, a lot of a lot of different experiences that we've had, some of which we'll share with you here today. But when we were approaching this project, we were asking a question that we often are asking about a particular place, which is, what is it worth? What is the Colorado River Basin worth? Now, it's really tempting to answer this question with something that we hear a lot, which is, it's priceless. It's, it's really impossible to fully value. And that's, that's accurate in a lot of ways there. It is impossible to really fully capture the value of this uh, massive, diverse, and unique place. But that's not a very useful answer. When you're sitting down to make a land use decision or a water use decision or a policy decision, it's priceless. It isn't actually very helpful. And so we sought out to provide uh, an answer that can stand alongside of that that provides a little bit more information to work with when uh, making those sorts of decisions. So our entire approach is based on thinking about the question of context. Often when we talk about, you know, the environment, we think of it as sort of a sector, a subsection of the economy. Um, there's the timber sector, the mining sector, there's water extraction. All these things are economically valuable and are often framed as being part of what drives the larger economy. Um, however, when we think about it, it's the case that all of these economies uh, exist within the larger scope of nature. Phoenix, Las Vegas, Aspen, these are huge economic centers that are physically present within the bounds of the Colorado River Basin. And all of the economic activities that we described, along with many others, all exist within this larger framework of our rivers, our valleys, our shores, our mountains, and all of this. 
And so this is something that we keep in mind. And those natural systems that we exist within do a great deal for us. They provide what we refer to as ecosystem services, a term which some of you, I imagine, are already familiar with. Just to give an example of a few of those services, um, I'm just going to list a handful. Obviously, freshwater supply is a hugely critical service that exists within the Colorado River Basin and, of course, beyond its bounds as well. Uh, carbon sequestration is something that we talk about a great deal. Um, and every kind of uh, biomass that we see within, in, the, in the basin, the forests, the shrublands, the grasslands, all of these can provide uh, benefit in this regard. There's biodiversity and habitat, the places for both the species that we, um, that we enjoy hunting or that we enjoy viewing or just that we appreciate having it be present in the world and supporting the larger, again, those larger ecosystems within which we reside. And there's recreation. Um, these are just a couple of rafters of the many who have come from far and wide to enjoy the beauty of the Grand Canyon. So those are just a tiny handful of the over 20 ecosystem services that we at Earth Economics look at. And these services and the places that provide them uh, are a particular form of capital that we refer to as natural capital. Now, we're all pretty familiar with the uh, concept of built capital. That's our buildings, our roads, our vehicles, our dams and levees, all of these things. These are all... Uh, constructs that we're familiar with and have a clear picture of how to value. They're not the only kind of capital that exists. We also have the social capital, the, uh, the human structures, the institutions, the policies that sort of guide us and surround society and the economics that we participate in. There's the human capital, the individual, their ideas, and there's the natural capital, which is going to be our main focus in this conversation. And all of these things can be priceless and can be valued. And so we look at uh, also one of the core ideas about natural capital in a way that it is very different fundamentally from built capital is the way that it changes over time. Now, once upon a time, this bicycle here was uh, presumably very valuable probably to some uh, child. It allowed them to get around. It was exciting. It was a form of recreation. It allowed them to get exercise. Uh, now it's not entirely, uh, it's, not, it's not adding a lot of value to that child's life or anyone else's except in the form of a great visual and an excellent anecdote. Um, this tree, on the other hand, whenever this bicycle was leaned up against it, was much younger, and now it's providing more climate regulation, it's cleaning the air more, it's sequestering more carbon, it's capable of uh, controlling a greater degree of erosion and so on. So natural capital sustains itself and appreciates over time, whereas built capital tends to degrade over time, something that we take into account when we're thinking about its value over a long period. So that's an overview of some of the basic concepts of valuing these natural assets and natural capital. And now I'm going to transition into talking a little bit about um, some of the thoughts that we had when we were applying these concepts in the Colorado River Basin. This image is a, is a great map of the basin and illustrates a couple of challenges that we face whenever we're talking or thinking about the basin. Um, so one, it's huge. It goes across seven different states, two different countries, and it's got stakeholders that reside far outside of its geographic bounds. So just to give a little tiny visual uh, hint at this, when we look at two different places in the state of Colorado, up near the headwaters and down on the Mesa Verde shrubland prairies, we can see how completely different those two areas in the same state are and the ways in which they interact with the river and with the human communities around them are also similarly very different. And so this is something that gets even more obvious and more dramatic when we look across the scope of the whole basin from the deserts in Arizona to the beautiful lush forests up in Wyoming. We have a very, very uh, different set of landscapes. Similarly, as that map illustrated, we have a lot of cities outside of the basin, a lot of agriculture, a lot of residential that relies on particularly uh, the water, the water provisioning ecosystem service that the Colorado River Basin provides. 
And so these are things that we kept in mind when we were approaching the valuation of the basin. So we looked at 14 different land cover types. And this list, uh, for anyone who's familiar with the uh, NLCD, the National Land Cover Database, it's going to look uh, not unfamiliar, but it's really not a good way of capturing that diversity of the basin that I mentioned. If we think about coniferous forests in the upper basin, we're talking, you know, fir and lodgepole pine and spruce, it's dense, it looks more like a forest you would find in the northern U U.S. or even up in Canada. But if you look at a coniferous forest in the lower basin, you're looking at um, juniper, pinyon pine, ponderosa pine, it's open, it's got a very different fire regime, it's just very, very different, and it looks a lot more like uh, the forest you would see elsewhere in the southwest or even down into Mexico. And so to handle this, to approach that while still using the sort of simple list of land cover types, we subdivided the basin into some of its uh, major watersheds um, using sort of the, the hydrological unit code classification um, to take a first approach at this and consider where we were, uh, the, how we were treating each of those land cover types based on where in the basin we happened to be. We also thought a lot about context. Now, if you're considering, um, uh, for example, the importance of mitigating soil erosion. If you are right next to a, a river, soil erosion is a big deal. It gets in the water, it contaminates it, makes it less good for drinking, it tilts up your dams, it makes a mess. Um, but on the flip side, if you are far away from the river and you're just sort of on a hill in the middle of national forest, for example, it's not as critical in the same way. And similarly, if you are uh, in a city and you have a small patch of trees that are, uh, you know, providing air quality improvement and climate regulation in a place where there are a lot of people who are affected by the cleanliness and the uh, temperature of the air versus that same wee little squash of trees, Again, back out in the you know, middle of a national forest, for example, uh, you can see that there's a very different value based off those different contexts, which is something we took into account when we were doing this study. Um, we looked at a variety of different ecosystem services as well. This is uh, the dozen that we featured in our report. And this is not a full list of every service that's provided in the basin, but this is the ones that we had good data about. Um, so that we were able to put a good number on them. So I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of these services and a particular concept that's going to come in handy when I talk about the overall value for the whole basin. So when we think about water, we kind of naturally are able to get in our heads the idea that there's a difference between water supply, I turn on my tap, water comes out, and water uh, storage, you know, all of the water that's waiting up behind a dam or in a lake or, you know, in the, in the hydrological cycles that could be turned into supply that I directly use. <clears throat> And so when we were valuing these particular ecosystem services, this is where we took into account those different beneficiaries from different places in the basin, looking at the rate paid by different types of users, those agricultural and municipal users who are inside and outside of the basin, um, get factored into this overall value. Uh, when we look at carbon sequestration and storage, we see a similar sort of idea as I mentioned with the supply and the storage where we have a flow of value from sequestration that's ongoing as the trees grow or the shrublands uh, become more mature, they uh, sequester more carbon, and storage, all that's being held at this particular moment in time um, within the biomass of the basin. And so we used, uh, we used some detailed data on sequestration rates and storage rates for different uh, types of forest and shrubland all across the basin and factored in data from the uh, International Panel for Climate Change in order to value those particular services. And so coming back to that same idea of a flow of value versus a store or stock of value, when we look across all 12 of those ecosystem services, we see something very similar. We see an annual flow of value on the order of 69 to about $496 billion. And also, we can think about the value embodied by that landscape as a whole when we think about uh, its, its existence into the future. And we can calculate an asset value. So this is similar to if you have a building or a business that you know is generating a certain amount of income uh, on an annual basis, you can think about, okay, well, 
how long am I going to hold this? How long am I going to be involved with this? And I can calculate a value of the whole thing based off of that time span. So we looked at a 100-year time span, and uh, we used, for starters, we used a 4.125% discount rate, which is fairly standard um, with the, uh, it, was, it was what was being used by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers when we were doing this study. But this is also a discount rate that's meant for use with built capital and has a lot of ideas around, uh, you know, value now versus value in the future. Uh, it doesn't really account for intergenerational benefits. Um, and when we, uh, when we think about this, we wonder, is it really the case that my glass of water today is way more important than my grandchild's glass of water in 60 years, or are those things equally important. And so just for uh, participating in that particular discussion, we also calculated the discount rate if we are the uh, asset value if we use a 0% discount rate. And we can see the huge difference there um, in value of the basin. But regardless, either way, these are really big numbers. And a really natural question to ask is where exactly did all of those values come from? Well, sort of at a surface level, we can say, well, we at Earth Economics have a toolkit that we've built over the last uh, several years uh, based off the data that we've been gathering over our whole time um, in existence and practice. Uh, it's got thousands of different economic values for ecosystem services um, that we use in order to calculate these sorts of values. But that's a little bit of a glib answer. And so the next natural question is, where do those values come from? And there's a lot of different ways you can calculate the economic value of nature. Um, for example, if you have a flood come through and it trashes your houses and it trashes your roads and you have to spend a whole bunch of money to deal with that, versus if you have a healthy, intact riparian buffer that avoids those damages, we can calculate the avoided cost um, that, we, that we have um, that's provided by those intact ecosystems uh, when we don't have to deal with uh, this kind of follow, like we saw in the wake of the Boulder County flood back in 2013. Or we can think about uh, how we value our beautiful and unique uh, recreational places. We could say, oh, well, we know that people value the Grand Canyon because they're willing to pay to get in. There's a park pass for that. But really, it's actually the case that people are willing to shell out money to travel from around the world, from very great distances, a great expense, to be in this beautiful place that is uh, unique uh, in all the world. And that then serves as an even more uh, comprehensive proxy for the degree to which we value these places, how much we're willing to pay in order to get there and to be in them. And another one of the uh, methodologies that's commonly used uh, is hedonic pricing, the idea that when you're on a river and you have a nice view, presumably, across the way, across the, the London Bridge here in Lake Havasu City, where it somehow managed to end up, uh, across to, you know, whatever plains or mountains or whatever you can see, being close to beautiful nature makes your house worth more. Um, and we can see and calculate that difference in real estate prices and use that as a way, again, of sort of getting at that value that's being provided aesthetically by nature in this case. So we have all these different values that people have done what we call primary studies um, of economic value in different places around the world. And then we want to look at a particular place that maybe we don't have a, an actual study for directly uh, somewhere in the basin. And, you know, we're trying to figure out that value. And we use an approach that's very similar to what would be used when you're trying to figure out what, you know, what price to put on your house uh, or, uh, you know, what, what business might be worth. This is a different method than what I described earlier. You know, the idea is you say, well, my house has two bedrooms, it's got one and a half bathrooms, it's got a garage, a fireplace, a nice yard out back, it's close to a park, um, and it's got this nice view over there. And I know how much uh, I, I, you know, I, I know how much how I feel about those things. But let me look for other places that have, you know, two bedrooms, one and a half bath, nice view, nice yard, all of that, and see what they have been valued at and what they've sold for. And I can use those as a proxy, as a quick, easy way without having someone come in and study every, you know, inch of carpet and every stone of mortar uh, in my house. And that's really valuable in these cases where we're looking at natural capital, where it would be extremely time or cost prohibitive to go in and do 
primary studies for everywhere in the basin, but where we can make intelligent approximations based off of those factors we named earlier, where are you in the basin, what kind of context are you in, are you near the river, are you near the city, sort of like the house being near the park or uh, having a two-car garage. And we can use those qualities in order to make an intelligent comparison. Um, this valuation that we're discussing was done in just a year, and it was very cost effective. And there's also room for further refinement and further study. But it gives us something that we can use and talk about and apply in the way that Rowan will describe very soon. Um, so without further ado, I will actually go ahead and hand the baton over to Rowan, who will continue from here. So just one moment while I switch that over. All right, I believe that uh, Rowan, you should be able to present now. Let me know if that's working for you. I think it is. Um, let me see. Can you see my? And there we go. There we go. Slideshow. Okay, are you seeing the slideshow? We currently are just seeing PowerPoint, not a slideshow. Oh, okay. Let me see. Just a second. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Corinne. Uh, following, up, uh, following up on Corinne, I'd like to discuss a bit how valuation of ecosystem services uh, can be applied to inform uh, management and policy decisions surrounding natural assets that produce those services, and also kind of think about how valuation can be used to develop more robust uh, funding mechanisms for natural assets at the scale that we need. So based on a number of projects that Earth Economics has worked on and beyond that as well, um, just wanted to look at some of the broad ways that we've been able to uh, apply ecosystem service valuation into planning and policy. and. I hope that you'll agree from these examples that, based on these examples at least, that um, valuation is becoming more common uh, and, uh, and accepted for addressing kind of significant complex issues surrounding the environment. I'll be focusing on uh, examples uh, related to monetary valuation, and that ecosystem services are quite often associated with economic value these days. But I'd also like to note beforehand that monetization is uh, not the only way in which ecosystem services can inform decision making. Other ways include quantitative descriptions or qualitative descriptions, which can be just as effective uh, depending on the policy context and the decision you want to make. So an overview of this, a few of the areas that I'll be discussing today, some in more detail than others, benefit cost analysis. Um, all government agencies use benefit cost analysis to make their investment decisions, and uh, including ecosystem services in benefit cost analysis, uh, can effectively shift uh, the balance of investment towards kind of more resilient and sustainable infrastructure. Damage assessment, um, in the event of natural disasters, uh, ecosystem services valuation can also be included in the damage assessment alongside your traditional infrastructure uh, like your roads, uh, bridges, houses, um, funding mechanisms. Um, so by understanding the scale of benefits that natural capital assets provide, uh, we can use that information to inform our future investments in those assets and kind of scale our investment um, at, the, at the appropriate level. Um, sometimes uh, valuation is, is necessary for this, but like I said, quantitative or qualitative discussion of ecosystem services uh, can also be used to help set uh, funding mechanisms at the correct scale and support those funding mechanisms. Finally, policymaker and public education. Um, so until recently, ecosystem services were uh, typically effectively valued at zero in economics. Um, of course, the view is, is beginning to change and uh, the values kind of that we produced for Colorado River Basin as well as other projects um, help to kind of support that message that nature is critical to the economy, um, does have a dollar value, and this is often the first step in um, advancing policy and practice. 
and of course accounting and asset management, which I won't go into too much detail on, but also areas in which uh, government agencies and private firms are increasingly thinking about incorporating ecosystem services. So a few examples under the banner of benefit cost analysis generally. Um, like I said, all federal, state, city, county agencies and also many private firms use benefit cost analysis to make their investment decisions. So this covers number of investments uh, types such as healthcare, levy construction, uh, education, road building, economic development, many others. So benefit cost analysis is great for capturing many benefits and costs, especially for our traditional assets like our built capital. Uh, but most benefit cost analysis still omits uh, environmental benefits. So in some cases, you might have a fish processing plant, for example, that counts as an asset in benefit cost analysis, whereas the uh, system that actually produces the fish, um, the watershed and the river, um, may not count as an asset, which is a little bit um, odd from our perspective. So uh, a local example of how we can incorporate uh, ecosystem services into B uh, benefit cost analysis or BCA as I'll call it from here. Uh, Seattle was one of the first government agencies to consider uh, services, ecosystem services in BCA to our knowledge. And uh, Seattle's policy is to conduct a BCA uh, when they have the option of doing nothing. We work with their water utility on a couple of uh, mini projects to add ecosystem services into their business case analysis which typically, where the BCA is typically very important. Um, the benefit to cost ratio has to be above 1.0 um, to kind of justify moving the project forward as a government agency. And the decision in this case here, um, the slide was whether to move back a levy along the Tolt River in Washington State. And so counting only traditional benefits uh, like your fish harvest, um, uh, it was kind of difficult to justify increased fish harvest, it was kind of difficult to justify uh, this $5 million project. So in other words, it was difficult to show that the benefits outweighed the costs. So we provided a white paper um, that included a wide range of ecosystem service benefits um, beyond your traditional economic benefits and costs that it would be associated with the setback. Um, so we showed that the project also provides flood protection, carbon sequestration, uh, recreation opportunities, Etc. And uh, kind of this helped to make the business case stronger for the project and supported the decision to move forward. And here is the uh, step back levy um, floodplain today, uh, providing some flood risk reduction as well as uh, fish habitat. The um, Chinook salmon are starting to um, use it, juvenile Chinook salmon are starting to use it as they move up uh, down river. So next example, um, at the federal level, uh, agencies are also beginning to incorporate ecosystem services into the BCA. So here's one example. Like, like other agencies, FEMA uses BCA to determine uh, where to invest its resources for the greatest benefits relative to taxpayer costs. So they were faced with some rising natural disaster costs and climate uncertainty. So in 2013, they actually became the first federal agency to adopt uh, valuation in formal policy. So they adopted this environmental benefits policy, uh, which allows the inclusion of ecosystem services in their um, BCA for acquisition projects. And it was based on 17 ecosystem service values that Earth Economics provided in 2012 for their BCA toolkit. And Actually, providing FEMA with local examples of ecosystem services, such as the Seattle example, um, earlier actually helped to kind of inform this policy and their approach. Uh, and it's one reason that local case studies and precedents are so important. And we're looking to work on more of those in the Colorado River Basin right now, actually, if you know of any. <laughs> um, and so this policy, FEMA's policy, is being applied to all flood and hurricane disasters for all 50 states. Um, and any infrastructure that's impacted by flooding. Um, and so basically FEMA applies ecosystem valuation nationwide. And 
Um, this uh, policy has been found to improve decision making, and so by looking at the flood benefits, uh, flood risk reduction, and other benefits of restored floodplains, um, <clears throat> FEMA now has the economic tools to um, relocate better, uh, to justify relocating people out of the floodplain rather than rebuilding the same structure in areas that get frequent flooding or repetitive damage. Um, another example at the federal level, um, and this is happening as we speak, it's hot off the presses. Uh, the, uh, as you may know, actually, the U.S. Housing and Urban Development um, Agency, HUD, uh, are collaborating with the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, investing in community resilience through this program competition called the National Disaster Resilience Competition. And uh, it's a two-phase process that they're, they're going to competitively award a billion dollars in HUD disaster recovery funds for uh, long-term community resilience. So they, they asked for some highly um, innovative and integrated proposals that are going to help communities reduce direct losses from future shocks uh, like floods, fires, earthquakes, and tornadoes, um, and also build resilience into um, through kind of community strength, stability, and addressing some of the long-term stresses like unemployment, business stagnation. Um, one of the most innovative aspects of the competition from our perspective was the range of benefits that HUD is recognizing in, this, in the benefit cost section for the proposals. So like FEMA, they recognize ecosystem services and a variety of other traditional, uh, non-traditional economic benefits, um, which are of course real but haven't typically been recognized programmatically by federal agencies until recently. Um, to be um, eligible, uh, the applicants have to be, have experienced a, a presidentially uh, declared major disaster in 2011, 2012, or 2013. And 40 states and communities made it through to the second round. Uh, we worked closely with four of the, the finalists on, on the benefit cost section of their proposals, uh, advised some others. Um, so one example of a project <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have a slide here, but we worked with the state of California on data collection research of their benefit cost analysis section. Uh, they had three projects that they were applying for um, following the uh, devastating rim, Yosemite Rim Fire that occurred in, uh, mostly in Tuolumne County uh, 2013. So that one of the projects was um, they, they were seeking funding for was Forest and Watershed Health, which is a uh, a uh, multi-year program to reduce fuel loads through fuel break installation, uh, thinning, replanting, and noxious weed control. And then they also had these other projects like biomass conversion, so a biomass plant um, to manage, <clears throat> actually help manage the fuel load that was coming out of those, um, that, those forest uh, thinning activities, for example. And also these community resilience centers, which would be multi-purpose facilities to provide refuge and services to folks in the event of future fires. This is all, these are all investments that would be made within the Rim Fire footprint, which is about 250,000 acres. Um, so we worked with about 20 subject matter in, uh, experts to identify and quantify, and then in many cases we monetize um, up to about 70 different costs and benefits that would result from these three programs. And so going on HUD's uh, HUD's guidelines, uh, the analysis also included many non-traditional um, benefits like ecosystem services, um, carbon sequestration benefits, uh, and others that were not related uh, uh, necessarily environmental benefits. <clears throat> and finally, kind of to round out this whole discussion, um, as probably uh, many of you are all aware, um, the federal government, uh, sorry, the White House recently released um, uh, um, a directive to federal agencies uh, so to request that they um, begin to look at ecosystem services uh, more programmatically. And so on October 7th, um, just a few weeks ago, the White House released this memorandum that directs federal agencies to factor in the value of ecosystem services into their federal planning and decision making. And uh, the agencies now have about six months to respond to the memo uh, by providing an assessment of how they currently factor in ecosystem services and kind of a plan for moving forward. And um, be very interested to hear uh, any perspectives from, <coughs> from your agencies 
on what's happening uh, there. And some exciting stuff is coming out of that, will come out of that, I'm sure. Um, here's another example, damage assessment, um, including ecosystem valuation uh, for looking at damage assessments. This is another area where valuation can be a useful tool. So we, uh, this is got, using a similar um, example to the one I just gave on HUD, but it's from a different angle. So we conducted uh, an assessment of the damages to natural capital caused by California's uh, Yosemite Rim Fire in 2013. So uh, FEMA initially rejected California's application for a major disaster declaration, uh, which would bring in um, additional funding uh, from the federal government. Um, Governor Brown appealed the decision and submitted a second, an appeal package to FEMA that included an analysis, uh, some changes to their initial um, uh, analysis, as well as an analysis of impacts to natural capital. Um, and so <clears throat> what we did for this project, while the fire was still 84% contained, we looked at, um, while the state was looking at things like damages to transmission lines and traditional infrastructure, um, like a shed with a lawnmower in it would show up as a damage, uh, we, we looked at the damages to ecosystem services caused by 250,000 acres um, that were impacted by the fire. And so um, <clears throat> the appeal was granted. Uh, we were told that the, the, our evaluation of the damages did support the um, application. And the, so that helped to bring in an additional $21 million in federal disaster assistance to Tuolumne County and local communities who <clears throat> desperately needed uh, that funding. Certainly wasn't, um, didn't cover all the cost of the Brim fire, but was um, helpful nonetheless. So as you can see, uh, this example focuses on kind of damages to ecosystem services and under the damage assessment banner, while the HUD example, looking at the same um, disaster, the Brim fire, uh, the HUD example is focusing on enhancing ecosystem services into the future um, using HUD funding. And so the ecosystem service approach allows us to look at both the asset side um, for future benefits and the liability side uh, damages of the balance sheet. <clears throat> and so um, this is just here uh, at a cartoon that came out in the Los Angeles Times at the time uh, California was initially rejected uh, for their major disaster, major disaster declaration. Um, here's the report cover for the report we put together in about four weeks. and. Um, here are the range of, of damages that we found um, just in the first year alone to ecosystem services. And we only used a subset of services. We didn't look at water supply, for example, because there was too much uncertainty. And we looked at San Francisco Public Water Utility, um, the PUC, um, on this closely. And we also looked at some other um, non-traditional damages, like carbon storage value loss, and that's $100 million at least and property value loss. So uh, the ranges were a little bit wide due to the, the quick nature of this project, but um, uh, even the low value uh, would be enough to kind of justify, um, show that the damages reached the threshold needed for a major disaster declaration. Uh, the threshold in California was $50 million damages. Uh, all of this, um, discussion is kind of related to funding mechanisms, but here I just want to talk about some specific other funding mechanisms that that can be supported using either uh, better messaging around natural capital, ecosystem services, or or explicitly valuing the services, and including that in messaging. So a um, project we uh, did, an effort we didn't work on, but we think is um, really, really great, really exciting was City of Flagstaff. Um, Recognizing the value of natural capital around their watershed, uh, they, they've kind of embarked on the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Program in the Upper Lake Mary watershed. And so they're investing in forest management for fire risk reduction, but also for erosion mitigation, and, um, and which would reduce sedimentation of reservoir waters. And so their uh, funding mechanism was a $10 million bond that passed just a couple of years ago for forest thinning. And they're also looking at um, this idea of a forest health fee that would go into the water bill 
and I'll give an example later that show you a utility that does have such a fee for forest investments. Uh, we worked with Santa Clara County um, in 2013 to look at uh, the value of open space in that county. And as you may know, Santa Clara County is also the home of Silicon Valley. So it's well known for its uh, human capital and its innovation in the technology area, but um, the natural capital is also incredibly important. And in fact, the open spaces surrounding Santa Clara County, uh, the valley there, uh, are critical recharge areas for the aquifer that lays beneath San Jose and supplies a lot of drinking water to um, about 2 million people in that area. And so our valuation study showed that uh, using case studies uh, on specific projects as well as countywide valuation showed that investment in open space and the, and the natural capital assets in that open space um, was kind of a, it's pretty essential to ensure continued prosperity of the county, not only um, Santa Clara County um, at large, but also Silicon Valley, of course, which depends on water, uh, and a high quality of life for folks. And the results were used to support messaging for this $120 million um, open space bond that passed in 2014 and needed two-thirds majority to pass and, in fact, got about 67%, so passed by about 1%. Um, we're biting our nails watching that one, but we were told that um, the study really helped with messaging and maybe was um, quite important swaying um, those couple of percent across to vote yes. Um, we also supported um, City of Tacoma um, in a similar effort. We looked at the value of uh, their natural assets uh, that are managed by the Metro Parks Tacoma, which is a city agency um, here in Tacoma that manages parks. We're actually based here in Tacoma, Washington. So the results uh, were used in their messaging materials to demonstrate the value that parks bring to the community, um, looking at ecosystem services as well as health benefits. And so in a city of just 200,000 people, uh, they passed a $198 million bond by two to one. Um, and we're told again that the, the numbers did help with some of the folks who are kind of more skeptical about some of these types of investments and bonds. Um, the example of how water utilities um, can recognize and better disclose the value of natural capital assets. Um, some utilities are, like I said, have a water utility rate surcharge now on their bills. So such as Central Arkansas Water, which is shown here, um, they've adopted these natural capital surcharges, which show up as uh, on the water bill, so it's a good communication tool to begin with. And then also the um, they funding from those surcharges are dedicated to watershed protection efforts. So Bellingham, for example, has a $5 per household per month um, surcharge. That all goes to acquiring easements around their Lake Whatcom watershed, um, which protects water quality into the future. <clears throat> and surprisingly, a lot of these We've, we've identified um, a handful of these utilities who have actually broken these investments out in their water bill. Many just invest in the watershed anyway, but the ones who have broken them out to separate charge have actually received um, surprisingly little pushback from their ratepayers. So these are typically popular uh, surcharges. And just um, go through a couple of these other examples pretty quickly um, to let you know what's happening. So on accounting, um, many uh, uh, water utilities, for example, rely on natural assets to provide water. Um, city, other city agencies depend on natural assets for other types of services, whether it's recreation or stormwater control. Um, under current accounting rules for state and local government, the, the natural infrastructure can only be valued for um, basically bare land and timber value. So arguably, in the case of water utility, the most important uh, asset on a water utilities balance sheet, which is the watershed, um, shows up for a small fraction of their total net assets. So we've had some questions. We've been working with uh, some local um, agencies, mostly water utilities at this point, to kind of better articulate this. Some of them have said that this affects their impacts, their ability to get access to capital, like tax exempt municipal bonds. Um, so we've kind of 
been in communication and uh, presented to the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, who set the accounting rules for the state and local government, and um, actually just at the meeting a couple of weeks ago, and kind of moving forward that discussion, asking some of these questions um, about whether accounting or um, better guidance on accounting for natural assets uh, would help some of these utilities better shift, that find a better balance of natural or green and gray infrastructure, and whether account, current accounting rules can limit their ability to invest in watershed projects. So for example, um, pretty easy for a utility to, in, to issue a $200 million bond for a filtration plant, like um, Seattle, for example. <coughs> uh, they're, they've protected their watershed, does the same job as a $200 million filtration plant, and that's just water filtration. Uh, one of the ecosystem services. Uh, but uh, if they wanted to um, issue a bond for a $10 million restoration project, uh, revenue bond, um, it would, uh, it's, would be a lot more difficult. So we've been looking at also um, some of these questions with uh, water utilities and others. And some, some have taken steps, uh, such as San Francisco, uh, for a better disclosure. So. Um, San Francisco and, and uh, uh, Portland have, have included some language in their the transmittal letter of their financial reports discussing the value of, of their natural capital and why they think that it's being undervalued. Uh, and the transmittal letter is, is not strictly audited section, so they, that, they feel like that's the natural first step. Um, and other utilities have been uh, communicating the value of their natural capital in cities with their bond ratings agencies, so telling them about how these investments in natural capital are are <coughs> lowering their risk um, from a bond risk perspective. So this just shows here um, you know, Seattle's balance sheet. Uh, it's a bit small, but uh, you can see that they they have a total asset um, net assets of about 1.3 billion, and uh, their natural capital. Uh, is reflected for about $40 million out of that $1.3 billion. Uh, so clearly one of their most important assets, since it captures and supplies and conveys their water, um, seems like it's being undervalued. So uh, just to wrap up, um, we think that hopefully these examples have shown that, that valuation can be useful in many cases. Um, these are just some practical examples. Uh, they're likely many other ways in which ecosystem services can be incorporated into decision making. Um, but here are just a few and uh, welcome your feedback and um, thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Rowan and, and Corinne as well. Uh, we do have a few minutes here for some questions if folks would like to ask uh, one of either of our presenters. So I just uh, remind you, please use the raise your hand feature um, Rowan, if you could look for those raised hands and call on folks. Once Rowan calls on you, please press star six to unmute and you can ask your question. Okay. See some. Here we go. Um, so Jack Schmidt has uh, a question. Go ahead, Jack. Hi, this is Jack Schmidt. Um, I'm wondering how your numbers uh, compare to the typical magnitude of numbers um, for hydropower production. Um, secondly, um, you know, the fundamental attribute of the Colorado River Basin is that nobody lives there. Um, it isn't an issue of setbacks or cities. There's very few population centers in the basin. The fundamental value of the Colorado River is that the water flows downstream for out-of-basin transfers to Phoenix and Southern California. Uh, and so the primary issues that people debate are focused specifically on the value of keeping water in rivers for recreational values and maintaining native ecosystems, and much less so on the watershed scale. And um, 
many of the EISs in the watershed extensively study exactly what you've been talking about. So I'm just wondering um, how your studies are linked with the various studies that have been done in the basin already. And um, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering about those linkages. <coughs> Thanks for your question, Jack. Um, this is Corinne. Uh, so I, I worked on sort of the first phase of this work back last year, and so I, some of the details are a little bit hazy, so please forgive me. But as far as the hydroelectric uh, question goes, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I know that we did have a conversation about whether or not we wanted to include hydroelectric generation as a value in our study, and we actually chose uh, not to do so. And so uh, it's it's a really interesting question. It's just not one that we specifically addressed in this work. So we're not able if, to. If, if I could just uh, interject here, in my experience running the Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center, it is precisely the issue of comparing environmental values with hydropower benefits that is the most important question before us. And it is the reason why the hydropower industry becomes completely unglued in understanding whether the numbers associated with environmental economics are numbers that ought to drive policy or not. Um, I'm not questioning what you're doing, and I love what you're doing, but it is an extremely contentious world that you're working in, and I would urge you to understand how the numbers stack up and to explicitly compare it with hydropower, because they will be the biggest opponent of this work. No, that's great feedback. Thank you so much for that. And that's something we can definitely, we're continuing to work in the area, and so that's something that we can, you know, look at in the future. So thank you for that. Uh, also, um, kind of on the hydropower um, question, Jack, the we're currently working on a project uh, or starting up a project in Washington State in the, in the Columbia Basin looking at the Lower Snake River and they have four dams uh, in the Lower Snake River, hydropower dams. And in this case at least, um, they produce about 2% of the power. Um, so the marginal benefits of the dams, we don't even really need that power here in the Columbia Basin because there are so many other big dams. So the marginal benefits of those particular dams are probably not as high as um, as the benefits of restoring uh, that huge amount of salmon uh, fish habitat upstream of those dams, um, which is not being used currently. So, but uh, in other cases, some dams that may may be produ uh, may be incredibly important to regional electricity um, power. So, it's uh, their marginal value is probably a lot higher. Um, I, I can't speak specifically to um, dams in Colorado River Basin versus environmental benefits. Um, but what you, uh, and often dams, you can look at dams as having a lot of environmental benefits too because often they have a big lake, a reservoir behind them uh, with a, a large amount of recreational benefits. Um, but that's an interesting, uh, I think, question and thank you for uh, bringing it up. So I think maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, Rowan, if you see anyone else you'd like to call on. I currently just see uh, Ken. Uh, Ken oh, my hand again. is still raised. <laughs> yeah. Apologize, I'll take it down. There we go. Yeah. Maybe we can quickly address, um, I think, Jack's second, the second part of Jack's question. Sure. So, um, Jack, you mentioned, uh, you talked about Colorado River Basin and that there's a low population in the basin and kind of that the water, a lot of the water uh, beneficiaries of the water flows are not inside the basin, like California, for example, uh, Denver, Front Range. So um, that's, that's, an, that's a very important point. And when it comes to ecosystem services, um, one way you can look at them is, uh, is from the perspective of the direction of the benefits they provide. So some services provide in-place benefits, 
So like food, for example, um, it grows in the location where you, where you plant it. Um, flood risk reduction, of course, is a downstream benefit. Uh, water supply, of course, has typically been a downstream benefit where your benefits are within the same basin, but then um, we've actually engineered the, the basin so that we can um, receive those water supply benefits from outside the basin, or folks in California can receive them, for example. And so uh, it does, in, in many ways, it does uh, increase the, the water supply benefits of the, of the basin because we've got more beneficiaries. So, and the value of, of, a, of an ecosystem services, uh, service depends on the number of beneficiaries multiplied by what they're willing to pay, for example. Uh, multiplied by what the the, uh, the capacity of of a of a ecosystem to provide service, but you also get kind of trade-offs. So when uh, you're sucking all that water out, um, you may have a trade-off where you're losing other services that are being provided within the basin um, because you're uh, decreasing the flow. Um, so I can't think of a specific example with the trade-off, but um, uh, but there are undoubtedly trade-offs when you're pulling water out of that basin. And so that's one way that you can kind of look at um, ecosystem services and how they can at least help you uh, think, about, um, think about policy and, and um, valuation. Great, well, we're just at the hour mark here and I uh, want to be respectful of your all's time. So um, thank you again to everyone for participating, and thanks again to our presenters for making time to be with us here today. As a reminder, the webinar was recorded and will be available on the DLCC YouTube channel. You can access the channel from our website, or you can just search Desert LCC on YouTube, and it will pop up. Once again, thanks, everyone, and have a great day.